Can you think of an ocean so big it dwarfs the Pacific, yet it's safer than walking in a park? Welcome back to a wild time before dinosaurs, when the real monsters roamed on land, not in the sea. Let's dive into a past where the oceans were a safe haven in a world turned upside down. A time when water was safer than land. In nature, there's almost an unspoken rule. The creatures in our oceans and seas are usually much scarier than those on land. This holds true even when you think back to the age of dinosaurs, when marine monsters were scarier than the creatures like the T-Rex. But there was a time, way before the dinosaurs roamed, when it was actually safer to be in the water than on land. Long before the dinosaurs, Earth went through a wild and dangerous time known as the Lopingian, the last epoch of the Permian period which happened around 259 to 251 million years ago. Back then, everything about Earth was different, even the length of days, thanks to the moon's closer orbit, making days last about 22 hours. But what made the land so treacherous compared to the vast oceans during the Permian period? Life on land versus water. Imagine the world's geography totally scrambled. Most of the land was clumped into a massive supercontinent called Pangaea. This giant landmass connected what is now Africa, the Americas, Antarctica, India, Australia, and parts of Europe. To the east of Pangaea, large islands made up of today's Siberia, Kazakhstan, and northern China existed. Further south, an island comprised of southern China and various parts of Southeast Asia floated around. And the seas around these islands? They were part of vast oceans, with the Tethys Ocean on one side and the Paleotethys on the other. Then there was the Panthalassa, a super ocean that made up over 60% of the Earth's surface, double the size of today's Pacific Ocean. It was the colossal sea unlike anything else in Earth's history. On land, Pangaea was no picnic. The climate was extreme, and the ecosystems were packed with some of the most fearsome and bizarre creatures to ever walk the earth. Survival on land was really tough, especially with the fierce competition and harsh environmental conditions. Meanwhile, the vast oceans were kind of a safe haven. Sure, there were still dangerous creatures there, but the marine life was less hostile than the terrifying animals on land. Ocean creatures had more room to move around and didn't have to deal with the harsh climates that were making life miserable in Pangaea. For many species back then, life in the water was actually the safer choice. Moving from land to sea, what kind of creatures could you expect in the vast Permian oceans? Marine life during the Permian. Just imagining an ocean double the size of the Pacific is nerve-wracking. You'd think it was a place to avoid, right? But despite its size, Panthalassa and other oceans back then were actually pretty tame when it came to their inhabitants. Sure, there were sharks, which had evolved 200 million years earlier. If you're a Permian enthusiast, you might be picturing the Helicoprian, a 26-foot-long shark famous for its bizarre spiral-toothed jaw. But by the Lopingian, this giant shark was already extinct, leaving the oceans relatively empty of giant life. Instead, smaller sharks were swimming around. The biggest one around was called Hesychotus, and it was about six and a half feet long, roughly the size of a leopard shark today. Not exactly the monster you'd imagine. These sharks were munching on soft, squishy things like squids, not hunting big prey. Other sharks at the time were even smaller hardly longer than your couch. And those sea scorpions you might have heard about from earlier times? They were almost gone. After thriving in ancient seas, they were just barely hanging on during the Lopingian, not the big predators they once were. But why were the oceans so empty? Well, about two million years before this period, a massive extinction event, the Capitanian mass extinction, shook up the planet. It hit marine life super hard. While you could still spot some trilobites and other sea creatures, they weren't around in big numbers or sizes. So, while the waters might sound boring without giant monsters, that was actually good news if you were living back then. The ocean was way safer than land. On land, after the same extinction event, life bounced back fast and fierce. New, terrifying creatures took over, making the land a much scarier place than the sea. The Rise of the Garganopsids but there was a group in particular that really thrived during this wild time, and they were nothing to mess with. Meet the Gorgonopsids, first discovered way back in 1876. 
Their remains were so scary that the paleontologists named them after the Gorgons from the Greek mythology, those mythical beasts that could turn you to stone with a single glance. Gorgonopsids were some of the earliest creatures to sport saber-tooth-like fangs. They had deep-set eyes, long, narrow skulls, and those razor-sharp, elongated teeth that made them look downright horrifying. They might remind you of the famous saber-toothed cats like Smilodon, but don't get them confused. These guys weren't cats or even mammals. They were therapsids a group that's sort of like the bridge between reptiles and mammals. These fierce predators first popped up around 265 million years ago, during the middle of the Permian period. Initially, they were small, no bigger than a shoe, and they hunted down tiny vertebrates. But as time marched on, they started to grow. Each new generation got bigger and meaner. The growth spurt really took off in the late Permian after their competitors, the Dinocephalians, bit the dust. That's when the biggest of them all, an Ostrancevia came onto the scene. This beast was a real monster, more than 11 feet long and tipping the scales at over a thousand pounds, which is about the size of a large bear, though most were closer to the size of a tiger. An Ostrancevia was built for speed, with sturdy, long limbs that made it both strong and surprisingly fast, perfect for running down medium to large herbivores. Once it caught its prey, the game was over. An Ostrancevia's teeth were weapons of destruction, over six inches long, curved, and finely serrated. They were perfect for slicing through flesh, causing massive blood loss and devastating damage to vital organs. An Ostrancevia really got around. It popped up in what's now parts of Africa, Asia, and European Russia. This beast was super adaptable living in all sorts of places from warm floodplains in South Africa to the cold, harsh deserts of Russia. These cold spots were only occasionally broken up by shallow lakes and sparse forests, home to Peltoparan, the go-to plant of the late Permian. Some experts even think an ostracevia might have had fur to help it deal with the cold, though that's still up in the air. Just imagine, having one giant Gorgonopsid roaming around would be scary enough, but the late Permian was crawling with them. There were tons of different Gorgonopsid species, especially in what's now the European part of Russia, including smaller ones like Proslav Levia and medium-sized ones like Suo Gorgon. While Perrin Russia sounds like a rough place, South Africa during the same period was even more intense. Down there, a whole subfamily of giant Gorgonopsids had evolved right alongside an Ostrancevia. Meet the Rubigine family, a group of saber-toothed creatures that were generally the largest of their kind. They had super strong skulls, no parosphenoid bone, a bone usually found at the base of the skull, and they constantly replaced their deeply serrated teeth, perfect for slicing through meat better than the Ostrancevia's chompers. These guys were chunky too. With some, like Rubigia atrox, nearly matching an Ostracevia in size, stretching up to 10 feet long in areas that are now South Africa and Tanzania. What's really wild about the Rubigia atrix is its massive skull, taking up over 15% of its body length. These skulls were also super thick and had bony growths, indicating these predators were built to bite and wrestle with big, tough prey. Interestingly, despite their fearsome appearance, they didn't have the strongest bite. Amphibians By now, you can tell the late Permian was a wild ride with predators dominating the scene. But that's just scratching the surface. The place was crawling with other carnivores, each weirder and more unique than the last. Take the protosuchids, for instance. These reptiles looked a lot like crocodiles, were slender, could grow quite long and had massive needle-like teeth. They were everywhere except Antarctica and North America. Then you had Chronosuchia, kind of like the protosuchids but with heavy armor on their backs, probably to fend off attacks from other big predators. They varied a lot. Some were completely land dwellers, while others liked a bit of water. Despite usually being around the size of a monitor lizard, some, like the Ural or Peton, could grow as big as the female American alligator. And we can't forget the primitive amphibians thriving on Pangaea. These creatures were the top reason to stay away from fresh water. Many evolved into top-notch ambush predators, lying in wait to snag anything that got too close to the water's edge. Among them, the Rhinosuchidae were particularly nasty. These tetrapods, 
like early ancestors to today's amphibians, looked like giant salamanders or crocodiles. The biggest of them, Uranocentrodon, was a 13-foot monster found in South Africa's waters. Herbivores It's pretty hard to imagine how herbivores managed to survive among such fearsome predators, but they definitely did, and they were actually thriving. Scattered across the vast landscapes of Pangaea, you'd run into a bunch of dicynodonts, captorhinids, and parasaurs. Even though they weren't as fierce-looking as the carnivores, herbivores were more diverse and had plenty of tricks up their sleeves to stay alive. An example would be the Lystrosaurus, which was about the size of a badger or a pig, but don't let its size fool you. This little creature was one of the most common animals around. It had a weird build, but was pretty tough equipped with strong forelimbs and tusks that it likely used to dig deep burrows for protection. Digging, it seems, was a popular survival tactic, as other groups, like the cyanophids, also took to burrowing, using their broad skulls to shovel through dirt. On the other end of the spectrum, you had the parasaurs, who went down a different path and turned themselves into armored tanks. Kind of like modern-day ankylosaurs, but without the club tails. These creatures often had large, bony scoots embedded in their skin and super-dense bones that added extra protection. They were also some of the largest creatures of the late Permian. The most famous among them, the Scutosaurus, tipped the scales at over 1.2 tons and was about as long as the large Gorgonopsids. Because of its hefty build, Scutosaurus was slow-moving and relied heavily on its armor for survival. Its defense game was strong, with spikes on its skull and muscles so dense they were nearly impenetrable. While Scutosaurus was only found in European Russia, the Parasaur family had members scattered across the globe. As wild as the late Permian was, it did have one silver lining when you compared it to the skies of the Mesozoic era. Back then, you didn't really have to worry about looking up for giant flying pterosaurs that could snack on dinosaurs. The Permian skies were relatively tame. Sure, there were griffin flies and Pelodictyoptera, which could give you quite a scare with their size, but they were harmless to anything larger than themselves and weren't very abundant or diverse, thanks to the fallout from the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. The biggest things flying around were probably the Weigeltisardae, a family of gliding reptiles. These creatures grew no larger than a big bat, and while having one tangled in your hair would be annoying, they were only a danger to insects and spent most of their days either on solid ground or in the trees. The land conditions. But the real drama was happening on the ground, thanks to Mother Nature cranking up the heat. Most of the action was in places like European Russia and Africa because huge areas were just too dry and hot to handle. Imagine temperatures averaging 35 degrees Celsius, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's double today's average. This intense heat led to massive deserts around the equator, making those areas nearly lifeless. In those central Pangean mountains, they stretched across the continent, creating dry zones that would challenge any survival show you've seen. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, around 252 million years ago, the Great Dying happened. It's the worst extinction event Earth has ever seen, kicked off by the eruption of the Siberian Traps, a volcanic area in Siberia as big as Western Europe. These eruptions were a disaster movie come to life spewing lava a kilometer thick and chucking out enough carbon dioxide and sulfur to crank up the global thermostat even more. Some places might have felt like Death Valley at its peak, all year round. Even if you were tough enough to handle the heat, the air quality would do you in. The eruptions pumped out gases that sucked oxygen from the air, leading to widespread suffocation events. They even wrecked the ozone layer, increasing ultraviolet radiation by over 5,000%. It's debated how long these harsh conditions lasted, but by the time it was over, Earth had changed drastically. 57% of all biological families and 83% of genera had disappeared. To give you an idea, the KT extinction that took out the dinosaurs wiped out about 17% of biological families. And while the land had it rough... Aquatic life faced even tougher times with rising water temperatures and acidification. But, ironically, if you had taken a dip back then, it might have felt like lounging in a jacuzzi. Probably the only plus side to being in the water during such a chaotic era. 
Thanks for taking a deep dive into the Permian period with us. If you enjoyed exploring this ancient world that was upside down, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more incredible journeys back in time and uncover more secrets of Earth's past. Until next time, 